Hi, welcome back to Buffalo Times. I'm Nancy Shade and we're here in the Golden Mean Studio Gallery on Bunker Hill Road and I am with Jerry Snyder, otherwise known as the Butterfly Man mm -hmm. or the Butterfly Guy or mm -hmm. <laughs> well, anything with butterflies. But he started out with insects and he's going to tell us how he started out and where it has taken him uh, into this this wonderful traveling world that you live in. Mm -hmm. Yes, I was. Uh, I grew up in Ohio near Lake Erie, about 15 miles from the lake, and um, it's, a, it's a large body of water and it has a lot of insects. And I happened, to, as a child, I happened to gravitate towards insects, um, butterflies, grasshoppers, praying mantises. Uh, when I was probably in the second grade or so, I joined a group of boys that one of the boys had a collection of butterflies and there was a few other boys in the group that would help him collect and we would run around town with our butterfly nets and collect butterflies. Um, so that's where I got my start and my interest. Um, that sort of uh, disappeared when I went to college. I sort of got into other things and left, left that kind of passion behind until... Well, wait, uh, what did you study in college? Oh, uh, in college I studied, I actually went to a Catholic seminary in Columbus, Ohio and studied to be a Catholic priest. Oh, and then wonderful. I And then I studied in Rome, Italy, and then uh, I was there for one year and I said, I made the decision not to go that route. So, um, uh, but went to Montana, moved to Montana, lived there for 15 years, met my wife, we had two children. Um, moved to Hardwick in 1995 and uh, part of, I, I became a children's librarian at the Greensboro Library in Greensboro and um, did that for a few years. And then I, um, I went out to Montana and a friend of mine out in Missoula uh, said, let's go up in the hills um, and he, he was into butterflies and he would give butterfly walks and he'd give talks and and uh, he didn't know that I had been into butterflies in my, my, in my childhood. So I went up in the hills with him and I was identifying this butterfly here, this butterfly there. And he said, you know, you should do something with that because um, it's getting to be a big thing. You know, like um, I, I give talks all the time on butterflies. And so I came back to Vermont after that trip and uh, started thinking about it and uh, thought, wow. I'm so, I was sort of at a crossroads as far as what I wanted to do. This was in... This was 21 years ago, and I, and so then I decided, oh, I've always wanted to do a board game, make a board game. As as a we, I came from a large family, six kids, and we were always playing board games. And so <laughs> I decided, well, why don't I make this butterfly game? And so I, I did that, and I I had 10,000 butterfly games produced, uh, and started peddling butterfly games. And, uh, and I've been doing that over the years. I have like 100 left. Uh, so I did that, and then uh, at the same time I was doing that, this was while I was a children's librarian, I was branching off into this production of butterfly games. And also, um, as a librarian, I would bring in presenters. That was one of my favorite parts of the job was we would bring in, during the summer, when the kids were off school, we had a budget at the Greensboro Free Library for uh, bringing in presenters such as magi magicians, musicians, storytellers. And uh, I would uh, bring in these people and I would say, wow, you know, this is really a, a pretty interesting life that these, these people like come into the library, they give these talks and they just wander around either through Vermont and other places. And I've always had a wanderlust. Uh, I like to travel. So I decided right then that I would pursue this. And so I created this program that was an educational program plus a craft program. And so I give talks on butterflies, give a slideshow talk on butterflies, bats, pollinators, and then the, uh, the kids will do a t-shirt craft at the end where they can either bring their own shirt or I provide shirts and we put butterfly cutouts, dragonfly cutouts, plants on the shirt and then we spray a fabric dye over the whole face of the shirt 
when you lift up the cutouts, it leaves this imprint, and it was really nice. So that's, that's what I've been doing for 21 years. I travel as far west as Ohio, as far south as uh, Virginia, and all through New England, and I do roughly 100 programs a year. And, and you also travel into South America or Central America. Could you tell us a little bit about how the butterflies migrate? Yes. And um, also what took you down to South Central America? So um, I've, for years and years, I've wanted to go down to see where the monarchs go, where their wintering grounds are. Um, <clears throat> they made the discovery of where they went by North Americans in 1975. And there's been so much literature and so much movie production on these monarchs in Mexico. And I've always wanted to go down. And finally, uh, this past January, uh, our son got married um, in a little town north of Puerto Vallarta in Mexico. And my wife decided, well, we're down there. Why don't we go spend a week after the wedding and see where the monarchs are? What a great decision. Yay, yeah, Karen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, we went into the area where the monarchs were. And uh, it was just amazing. There's, uh, we were both at a loss of words when we saw these butterflies, tens of thousands of monarch butterflies fluttering around. It was a sunny day, we were lucky. Uh, and they were fluttering around through these canyons and where they overwinter. And it was just the most amazing spectacle. Um, the closest thing that I had come to that spectacle was when I was 11 years old. Uh, our home, my hometown in Ohio is is almost due south of Pelee Island. And uh, the monarchs from Canada cross Pelee Point in Pelee Island and then come through the United States on their way down to Texas. And um, So do they stop at Pelee Island? They often will stop at Pelee Island. So there's, there's tens of thousands of monarchs on Pelee Island at one time. This is in September when they're migrating south. Oh, see, and that's why they were out when Sandy and I were in Monhegan Island and the asters were the yellow and purple. Yes. And we were <clears throat> resting, and when that's when we woke up, and mm -hmm. they were everywhere. Yes. And we just couldn't understand why are they here? How are they? How mm -hmm. do they happen to be so far out? Because that island is far out. Yeah. But they might maybe they they like the water. You mm -hmm. said that insects like water, and, and you they'll grew follow up the water. Yes. When they're migrating, they will follow the coast. And then, as I was saying, in in up in uh, at Pelee Island, they would cross. And so there was one day I came into this grove of trees where my friends and I would go because they had gardens. It was the uh, Hayes Memorial, uh, Rutherford B. Hayes Memorial Gardens. He was a, the president of the United States and, uh, and he, had his, he had his house there and there's a museum there and there's these gardens. And so we, would go, we would go into this place and one day in September, I went in and I looked at these pine trees and many of the limbs were brown and they had been green the day before. <laughs> and I'm wondering what is going on? So I, I went over and they were just filled with monarchs. Remarkable. And when the sun came out, they were there probably three, three days or so. And then they took off and, and continued their migration. But uh, one of those days the sun had come out and so all these brown monarchs in the sunshine opened up and it was just this complete orange. Uh, these these limbs were orange and they were fluttering around and it was just amazing and so and I had it's really hard to find words for something that's that kind of it's hard to find words it's it's like a it's 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 a sacred thing mm -hmm. and to try to put words on what's going on inside and outside is pretty phenomenal and um, so when you were in Central America you or in Mexico you went to the place where they hibernate for the winter, right? And that's even more clustering. And right. so that is what kind of a tree do they cluster on, um, and why that kind of tree? Pine trees and Oyamel fir trees, and it's basically that's those trees are what grows in that environment, which is ten thousand feet high in the mountains. It's a real special environment that has enough protection. The temperatures are just right, so that the monarchs don't freeze. It's not too cold. Um, and it's not too warm because they don't want to. They don't want to fly around too much because they'll use up their energy. Energy. Mm -hmm. They they are down there resting. They're living off the lipids, the fats reserves that they've gotten from traveling through our country, nectaring on flowers, and so it's the perfect place for them to go and spend the winter. Do they go as far north as Central Canada? 
they go as far north as the, the milkweed plant. I because see. Because they lay their eggs on the milkweed. And so if there's no milkweed, they will not go that far. So they're, so they're southern, they're, southern Canada. They're born in the north. The, the north is their breeding grounds. That's where they lay their eggs. Um, they leave Mexico in March, middle March, and that same generation that came down uh, in September overwinters and then heads up and goes as far as northern Mexico or, or Texas or Oklahoma. They're called the Methuselah generation hmm. because they live so long. Oh, they do? They live as, they live six to seven months, whereas the average butterfly lives three to six weeks. Oh. Um, this generation of monarch, monarchs that leave, our, leave Vermont in September, October, they don't develop, and so what really kills butterflies is the mating process. Once they mate, the males will die off, females will lay their eggs, and then they'll die off. Whereas this generation uh, is not interested in that. So they're interested in just basically getting down to Mexico. And once they've overwintered in mid-March, then they, they've developed, and then they start the mating process. But the <clears throat> cocoon is in in the northern area. The chrysalises, yes. The chrysalis. Yes. yes. And so how long does it take? They mate, then they have they have the chrysalis or how they, does they that mate, work? They mate, they lay their eggs on the underside of the milkweed plant, uh, hatches into a caterpillar. Caterpillar eats the egg. How, how first. long does it take to hatch? It takes um, the egg it takes probably a week or so. That's all? For the yep. And then it turns into a butterfly? Then the egg turns into a caterpillar. Oh, a caterpillar. And then the caterpillar takes about 14 days. And, 14 days. And, and, it, and it sheds its skin uh, four times. The fifth time that it sheds its skin, it becomes the chrysalis. And then it's inside the chrysalis maybe another 12, 10 to 13 days. And then the monarch emerges. In the summer? Yeah, this is in the summer. So the ones that we see here are freshly... They oh. are, they are basically the um, probably the second or third generation the ones we see, yeah. Um, the first generation that has gone down to Mexico overwintered, that that Methuselah generation will make it back as far as Texas um, and Oklahoma, and then they will lay their eggs, die off. Those caterpillars will go through the whole process, become a butterfly, and they'll be migrating north. Uh, through the summer and then they, they will go up as far as Canada and then they just fill out. The next generation will just stay there and they will live three to six weeks and die off and lay their eggs. And then we have the generation that hatches out in August and September and that because of the, the because of the, day, the daylight and temperatures, the days are getting shorter the night temperatures are getting cooler, and that triggers something in the caterpillar that says, when I hatch out, I can't keep going north like my ancestors did. I have to go south. I see. And they're, they're, they're four generations removed, wow. but they go back to the same trees that their ancestors came from. That's amazing. Yeah. And they, they discovered the monarchs in 1975, and that's a very interesting story itself. Uh, a professor from Canada, this uh, Dr. Urquhart and his wife were tagging monarchs. They had, they had all these volunteer, these kids, 13, 14, 15 year old kids. They call them civil scientists. And, and where were they located? And these were all over the United States. Wow. And they taught them how to tag the monarchs uh, and they would follow the monarchs. Sometimes the tags would have numbers on them and if somebody found a, a monarch with a tag, uh, they would report that back to Dr. Urquhart in Canada and then they would trace these monarchs and they would find them. They found them in Florida. They found them in Texas. Uh, one tag came from Cuba. And so they knew they were going south, but they didn't know where they were going. Uh, and so then finally in 19, I think 1971, they found one monarch, a tagged monarch all the way down in central Mexico. Mm. So this doctor was was going, wow, and, and there had been reports of, of a lot of monarchs going into these mountains. They're called the Neo-Volcanics, and they're in central Mexico. And uh, so this doctor said, he, he got a hold of this guy who was an engineer living in Mexico City, uh, a guy named Ken Bruger, and he, told, he said, you know, 
we found a monarch really close to Mexico City, and so they, you know, they must be going there. And uh, can you kind of look around? And so, uh, so this Kenneth Brueger fellow, uh, he had a partner, and uh, what was her name? Um, Catalina Trail. And she was a, nat a Mexican naturalist, and quite a bit younger than him. And she decided to join him to look for the monarchs. And they traveled all around. F uh, they, had, they had gotten this letter from Dr. Urquhart in, in, a, in a newspaper mm -hmm. that said he wanted volunteers to help to try to find these monarchs that they, he thought they were in this area. And so this, this Berger guy and his, and his, his, his partner, Catalina Trail uh, went through the mountains. They lived in a truck, um, and they just for months they went around through the mountains in central Mexico looking for these monarchs. They knew that the monarchs went into areas that had enough moisture, and there was a certain temperature that they where they wouldn't freeze, and they it wouldn't it'd be it wouldn't be too warm that they would use up their energy, and so they had pinpointed this area. Uh, around a town of Angangea, which is an old mining town. And finally, one day in January, I think it was January, early January, uh, the woman uh, saw these trees um, and found the monarchs. And, uh, and that was in 1975. Um, that must have been quite a find. But did the indigenous people know that they were there? The in, there were some, there were people who knew they were there. There were there had been reports, historical reports of people seeing these monarchs um, that go way back, you know, hundreds of years. But they didn't know exactly where they where they lighted and no, where they, they no they didn't know clustered where clustered in yeah. to keep warm. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and then once they 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 also didn't they also knew that they left in the spring. And they didn't know where they went. And they'd see the flock. They would see them going north. Is it called a flock? Uh, it's a colony. A colony. A colony of monarchs. Um, and they would see the, the monarchs heading north, but they didn't know where they went. And so, and so this, this was a golden age of, of monarch discovery from 1975, probably through the 90s, 1990s. Well, and now, were, now that they've been discovered, are they still safe? Or uh, has all this population and uh, um, environmental uh, problems, has this been a threat to them at all? Um, yes, the, the, the environment and climate change and illegal logging in the, in the reserves where the butterflies are, that's all a threat to them. Um, and the numbers of, of monarchs have been going down uh, over the years. The trend of populations of monarchs is going down a lot of it's because of, of the overdevelopment of wildlands in our country. So there's not as many, much milkweed. There's not as many nectaring sources for the monarchs when they're heading south. And there are too many people. <laughs> yes, a lot of people, and uh, that need all this food. So they plant, you know, and they plant, food and they plant corn and, and wheat and soybeans, and uh, and where wild plants would have been wild what, nectaring sources. So, uh, so the monarchs are up against a lot. They yeah. have a lot of obstacles. Um, and, but and they're, they're still abundant. They're abundant, but they're not as abundant as they used to be. For, for example, in, in 1997, they measure the monarchs in acreage. How many acres of forest do they occupy? Um, and they call them hectares is the Spanish word for every hectare is 2.7 acres. And for instance, in 1997, there were 18 to 19 hectares of monarchs. That's a lot of monarchs. Um, in 2014, there was 0 0.67. Um, and ever, in, it's, been, it's been up to as far as as many as six hectares. I think that was in 2018. But the trend is downward. Um, and, you know, and it's, I mean, they're saying with climate change, if, if the climate, if the temperatures rise, too much, then then it's going to warm up too much in these these areas where the monarchs overwinter, and they're going to be leaving too early. They'll make it up too early into Texas. <clears throat> the milkweed won't have will not have grown up. So there's a lot of imbalance if that happens. Mm -hmm.
Yes, so it's a uh, so they're up against a lot. The, the newest thing is is avocados. Uh, what what they're discovering is uh, because of climate change, a lot of the old avocado plantations that are in Michoacan, where the monarchs are, in the lower elevations, it's too dry and it's in uh, and they aren't growing well. They need a higher elevation, so the so the the these plantations are moving higher and higher and higher, and and now they're starting to encroach on this monarch butterfly biosphere reserve, which is a number of acres where the monarchs are. And so now we're getting avocado farms that are being planted really close to the monarchs, and that's, that could be a problem also. But do the monarchs um, pollinate the avocados? Um, no. Um, the monarchs are, once they leave, they're just moving north. For and the milkweed. Yeah. There are butterflies that pollinate, you know, the avocados. Uh, there are butterflies that stay there, you know, year round, and you know, there's average butterflies. But the monarchs themselves, um, it's it's pretty much squeezing them. It's encroaching on the areas of the, these trees, and there's illegal logging also. People need firewood. Um, uh, people need to sell wood products, and so they're they're taking trees that are buffer zones that help maintain the temperatures uh, for these monarchs, <clears throat> and that's jeopardizing the monarch populations also. So can their government protect them? Is there um, the, the Mexican government and the United States government and the Canadian government have gotten together um, and they're working, you know, they've funded um, organizations that are trying to reforest the trees. They're trying to help um, the landowners who Basically, in 1986, they created this biosphere, this monarch butterfly reserve, and it was private land. So they, they basically were taking land from private landowners and basically saying, there's restrictions now. You can't do this, you can't do this. You can do this, but you can't do this. And so it, the, the landowners suffered because they didn't have access to the trees uh, like they had in the past. And so they're trying to figure out some way of compensating um, the landowners, I mean, there's a number of people who, um, who work these butterfly reserves w with all the tourists coming in. So there's that kind of, there's food vendors, there's guides. We had an 18 year old gal who was our guide and she took us up to see the monarchs. And so, so for five months out of the year, that's, she makes money uh, being a guide for the tourists. They call them mon monarchistas. Monarchistas. And, um, and she would take us up there and and so for five months until mid-March, that's what her job was. And then afterwards, she said that, we said, what do you do when the monarchs leave? And she said, well, I go into Moralia, which is three hours west, and I clean houses. So they just pick up different work. But, so there's some work for the locals, but they really need to be compensated um, for having to, you know, to have, have this, this government agencies and private agencies um, uh, take this land and use it for the monarchs. Yeah. And they don't have land trusts and they can't, they can't, um, they have to have it owned by the people but protected. Yeah, they want it to be, you know, it is owned by the people but again those people don't have uh, full rights to the land because they want to preserve it for the butterflies. Well. It yeah. gets complicated. It gets complicated. As soon as things are discovered, it gets complicated. Yes. And I mean, so there's all these obstacles to the yeah. monarch. So when, you know, there's obstacles coming down, if it's too dry, they don't get enough, they don't, they don't get enough nectar. And so they don't have enough lipids, fat reserves to make it through the winter. The ones that do make it through the winter, if sometimes it's bad weather in Texas coming back up. And so they, the, if it's too hot and dry, the milkweed won't grow. So they don't have they don't have sufficient milkweed plants to lay their eggs on. So there's a lot of obstacles and the, the, the most recent one is the avocados, but the, also the mining company that was mining for silver and gold and copper for years. Uh, one, of the, the water. One, of the monarch, one of the mining companies has now decided they want to open the mine back up and it's on the, it's, 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 the land is near the reserve. So the monarchs are facing uh, quite a few obstacles. Well, um, this, this tray that I got at the Antiques and Uniques many years ago, 
I mean, these are butterflies that had died, probably, mm -hmm. and they, they take and they make these beautiful artworks um, with the yeah. butterfly yeah, wings. Yeah, and these are all monarchs here. Uh, these are giant swallowtails, um, this out, this, the yellow and black. Um, yeah, there's a number. There's the morphos, the ones I have. This is a, this is a tropical species found in Central America and South America. And the zebra. The zebra, yep. Which is the zebra? Um, the zebra long wings are these right here, these little... Oh, um, yeah. Yeah, I have one in my collection of zebra long wing there. <clears throat> these are great. So, and with your game, does any of the money when people buy your game go to the preservation of, of the butterfly uh, no, uh, retreat? No. No. Um, I donate myself. I donate money to uh, different organizations, but uh, but I haven't earmarked anything from the game. How much is the game? Uh, it retails at the Galaxy Bookshop. Um, I'm not sure what they sell it for. Around twenty-four dollars. That's a good yeah. Christmas present it price. Is. It is. Yeah. I mean, the whole family can enjoy it. Yeah. So, are you going to manufacture more? I'm not. I, I've got other interests now. Oh, yeah. Like, where? What direction are you going in? I'm going in the direction of uh, writing. Like, yeah. um, uh, Bill McGibbon. Bill McGibbon, yeah, he's a yeah, yeah. Although my writing is more fictional writing. Oh, and, fictional. And then I am doing. I am working on an article uh, about the monarchs. So. Um, so, uh, fictional. You mean you're going to write stories? Uh, I'm, I'm writing stories, yes. I write short stories and I have, uh, I have two novels that, I've, that are in process. Yeah. One, cool. one has some butterflies in it. Does, does it have a title? Um, the title of the novel that's about, it's about baseball, really. It's a baseball novel, it's a father-son novel, has some butterflies in it, and it's called Finding Home. Wow. Yeah. It's the great American game. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah, all the guys, it's, you know, they hit the ball as hard as they can to get away from home plate. And then they want to come and back. And then they want to run all the plates around to get back mm -hmm. to home plate. Yep. The good American <clears throat> man. Yep, yep. So have you... Finding been, home. Finding home. <clears throat> so um, when will this book come out? I don't know. <laughs> I, uh, I've got so many other things going on that I... Uh, I, I write a little bit, and you know, I haven't. Um, I I think that marketing something is almost as challenging as writing. Oh, producing. marketing takes a whole agency of people, really. Yeah. yeah. I mean, with artwork, I, I, it takes all my time to do it. Mm -hmm. I don't have time to market it. Yeah. And it's expensive. Yeah. Because all the advertising is expensive. Yeah. I mean, if you put an ad in American art. It's mm -hmm. very expensive. Yeah, it's and a lot easier with this because I just I, I go around do my programs and then people want to buy the game. So, and people uh, for Christmas or, or yeah. birthdays are yeah. willing to put out yeah. twenty five dollars. Yeah, yeah. Whereas a gicle print, it costs you twenty five dollars just to make it. I did this little sketch uh, years ago of a butterfly catcher hmm. when I lived on a farm down in Waitsfield, and I just thought uh, I think I'll give it to Jerry. That is so nice. <laughs> The, the butterfly catcher. Look at that. He has his net. Yeah, it's a big I, net. I see it. So yeah. I had to use the net the other night because we uh, we found a giant swallowtail butterfly flying around in our guest room. And how did it get there? How did it get there? We were trying to figure that out. And how giant was it? The giant swallowtail is the largest butterfly in North America, and it's not common to Vermont. It was first sighted in Vermont in 2015. Because of climate change, things warming up, the, it's a southern butterfly that migrates to the summer, like the monarch does, but it doesn't go back anywhere like the monarch does. So uh, uh, we've started finding giant swallowtails in Vermont, in two, like I said, in 2015, and I will see probably two or three a year. They're not very common. Um, and I have a plant in my garden that's a caterpillar plant for the giant swallowtail. And what we're thinking is it, a giant swallowtail, unbeknownst to us, must have come through our garden, laid eggs on that plant, and then the caterpillar must have traveled across our yard to where we put our house plants out for the summertime, made a chrysalis uh. on the house plants. We brought the house plants in in October, and it just hatched out 
two nights ago. That's amazing. So is it still fluttering around? No, it's, it's, it, uh, any butterfly who hatches out in, any butterfly that hatches out in Vermont in the middle of March, it's not going to have a happy ending. Mm -mm. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's going into my collection. Well, Let's put it that way. It's probably so happy that it was there that the ending, ending is to be kept. Yeah. And you can keep it. Yeah. And you didn't bring it with you. I didn't bring it with me. No. Oh. No, it's it's still I have it on I have it on a dresser with coins on its wings to spread out and then it takes about twenty four hours for the wings to dry. Uh -huh. And then I put them into my frames. Okay, so um, what kind of plant is that? It's called Rue, R U E. Um, and I don't know what the Latin is. Um, he he rued the day he Came off the plant. <laughs> he rued the day that he late came off the, the rue plant. Yeah. Um, prickly ash is another um, caterpillar plant for the giant swallowtail that's found in Vermont. So, does the rue plant um, have flowers? It does. It has little yellow flowers. Yep. And uh, yeah, the, so in the summertime, usually in July, a uh, giant swallowtail may come into the garden. Um, we have plenty of flowers for it. And it may find that root plant and lay its eggs on the leaves, and then, then they become a chrysalis eventually. And then how long will it live after it becomes a, a butterfly from a chrysalis? The average butterfly anywhere, um, it lives three to six weeks. Mm -hmm. We have some exceptions. The monarch's an exception. We have some butterflies like the morning cloak and the, what else, the Milbert's tortoise shell and some of our... Some, a couple other butterflies that will hatch out in August and they go through the winter in their adult form. Hmm. They, will, uh, they will find places on porches, in nooks of trees, and they'll just, they have something in their blood, kind of like antifreeze, that they can withstand the winter temperatures. And then on a nice warm day in March, snow could be on the ground, sunny day. It's in the 50s, you might see a morning cloak, you might see a Milbert's tortoise shell, a, a, a question mark. Some of these butterflies that overwinter as adults, you would see them, and they, they, can, they can live, they can live months, mm -hmm. you know, a few months. That's where science is so interesting. Uh, the science of natural science is, mm -hmm. is uh, as though everything is here and provided for us to seek out and become useful in some way, like the, like the horseshoe crab I was talking about. You know, mm -hmm. the blue blood and. It's useful for hemophilia. Mm -hmm. If they had yeah. saved um, um, Nicholas and Alexandra's, the Tsar of Russia, if they had had that when he, that little boy, had uh, hemophilia, mm -hmm. um, they would have given him the serum, and he would have been fine, and and um, maybe we never even would have had the Bolshevik Revolution because <laughs> wow. they sort wow. of blamed that on, yeah. um, what was his name, Rasputin. Oh. Because they said, oh, she's having an affair with Rasputin. And it wasn't that the, mm. uh, Alexander was having an affair with Rasputin. It was that he was helping the child with his hypnotic, mystical ways mm. to not become sick. Hmm. And so she was dependent on him for the life of her child. Huh. But now they can take the blue blood out of the horseshoe crab and they make a serum that helps hemophil hmm. hemophiliacs. Wow. So, I mean, we're, we are, there is always good mm -hmm. that comes out of science. Yeah. And there's also great harm. Hmm. I mean, with how people use science yeah. really matters. Yeah. yeah. But the natural sciences seem to be the best for yeah, humanity. Yeah. I'm always I'm always intrigued by the natural world because there's so many little things about things in nature that most people don't know. And it's just like there's mysteries like how do the monarchs three generations, four generations later, they've never been to Mexico, but they go to the same tree groves that their ancestors left. Um, and there's all kinds of interesting, in, instinct, you know, the, the bat, the, you know, the way the viceroy butterfly mimics the monarch. The monarch is poisonous to birds. Oh, yes. And so um, if a young bird that doesn't know any better eats a monarch, it gets sick. And then there's, we have a butterfly called the viceroy that, that's a local butterfly here uh, that looks just like the monarch. It's and nice. the viceroy is a local butterfly. And 
I was a little bit disappointed when maybe 15 years ago the state of Vermont decided to make the monarch butterfly our state butterfly. Oh. And, uh, and the monarch can't live here in Vermont. It's, if, it, if it overwintered, its chrysalis would, would not make it through the winter. So it has to go to Mexico, back to Mexico. Whereas the viceroy, it's a tough butterfly and it, it lives here and it goes through the winter. And, uh, or the morning cloak, uh, another tough butterfly that overwinters in its adult form. I would have preferred that. And so what did they do? The, the monarch is our state butterfly. I see. Yeah. Well, so. we do have a lot of milkweed. And, and the monarchs are an important butterfly. Uh, yeah. I just, as, you know, I just think that uh, I like local. I like being local and, and advocating for local, and uh, the monarch isn't a local butterfly. But the little one that... The viceroy mimics, is. The viceroy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we can have a hardwick viceroy. We viceroy. Could. Yeah, we, we could. can have that as hardwick butterfly. We could. We could do that. So let's start small. Okay. Because the viceroy is smaller it's than the smaller, monarch. It's a little smaller, yes. And, and we are protected by the monarchs here, mm -hmm. in a way, by the, by the people who are the big people. Yeah, <laughs> yes. We kind of managed to get, thank you, Kurt. Yeah, so there <laughs> we go. So, so, so this is the monarch, that's the monarch. Yes, and that's and the viceroy. That's the viceroy. It's a little bit smaller. We're going to tilt that. Yeah, so you can see the monarchs here. And then the Viceroy has a line through the underwing that the monarchs don't have. But the biggest thing I tell people is that the Viceroy is from here. Uh, you know, it goes through its whole cycle in Vermont, in the north, in, in New England, whereas the monarch can't do that. Hmm. They're so much alike. Um, and the birds will go after... They won't go after this because they think it's a monarch right. it, it who is poisonous it, to the birds. It mimics the monarch, yeah. So the mountain thrush will not no. eat any of these. No, no. So in a way, we're more safe than the big guys. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. we're not poisonous yeah, either. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> in other words, we're not as corrupt. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, there you have it. What is this one? This is beautiful. Uh, that one is not from here. That one is... Uh, my wife purchased that and gave it to me, and I took it out of this frame and put it in here. And that is the sunset moth, and it's from Madagascar. Wow. It's iridescent. It's iridescent. Yeah, same as the Morpho is iridescent. They're such beautiful things. Beautiful things sometimes don't last very long. They're sort of ephemeral, right? Ephemeral. That's a good word. But, but don't, don't they relate the butterfly to the resurrection? They do. That whole transformation. You know, of, because of, it's transformed from a, go through the process of the transformation for me. So it's, in the, the major transformation is the caterpillar <clears throat> goes into this chrysalis, this dark place, and out of that dark place emerges the butterfly. And so you can, you can, you can use that as a metaphor for um, our life and our af in the life after this life. Or you can just stay in this life, in this world, and say, you know, we have... Sometimes we have dark moments. We have to go into these dark places before we can blossom and bloom. Yeah. It's like the little prayer that I say from time to time on air, which is, there is a cross in every life and a constant need for prayer. But the lonely heart that leans on God is happy everywhere. Hmm. And hmm. we that's our, our, our family prayer. Hmm. I hmm. never told people it was our family hmm. prayer. But its I knew somehow the butterfly was related to the resurrected life. Yeah, and I heard that the, um, you know, the, the, the fish is a, a symbol of Christianity. Yeah. And I heard that before the fish, even, before they adopted that, uh, they had the butterfly. Oh, that's interesting, mm -hmm. as a symbol. As a symbol. And then the 12 days of Christmas symbolizes everything that's connected to the Bible. Hmm. Did you know that? No, I didn't. I'll show it to you someday. Okay. It's interesting. Okay. Well, this has been fun, and uh, I really appreciate your coming up to the studio on this mud season day where the road was <laughs> not traversable. <laughs> it was but, very interesting. It was, <laughs> yes. But we managed to put the show together, and thanks to Kurt's truck and his hard work, and uh, we hope you come back and watch our next show. Thank you so much. Thank you for thank, coming. Thank you. I had a good time. Oh, so did I. <laughs> Thank you.